gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, will each control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized for as much time as he wishes. Mr. Speaker, President Washington once said, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of earlier wars were appreciated by our nation. There is no doubt that we appreciate the service and sacrifice of each generation of veterans. From our original veterans, patriots, to those who landed at Normandy during World War II to present. We as Americans and as lawmakers are forever in debt to the dedication of our military men and women who bore the pain of battle physically and emotionally. And while we stand here in this chamber each day and pledge our allegiance to the American flag that they defend, while we're able to act as a democratic body freely elected by the people thanks to their sacrifices, sometimes simple appreciation isn't enough. We have a chance today to treat our veterans with the honor they deserve by ensuring that they are fully compensated for their service during retirement while also addressing other concerns facing our nation. Today we will take up the legislation under consideration to ensure that all servicemen and women who are enlisted prior to January 1st of this year will receive the full cost of living adjustments in retirement before and after the age of 62. Furthermore, this bill also ensures our seniors will have access to the health care services they depend on through Medicare. For too long, the relationship between doctor and patient has been strained by the confusion and instability of a well-intentioned but unaddressed problem with the Medicare program itself, known as the Sustainable Growth Rate, or SGR. A component of this legislation works to ensure that seniors are able to receive the care they depend on from the physicians who know them, while also guaranteeing that those physicians are fairly compensated by Medicare through a fund until long-term reform of the SGR is achieved this spring. In doing so, this legislation provides needed stability for the medical community by ensuring that physicians have the predictability and billing they need to further their practice and to focus on their patients. By taking up and passing this legislation in bipartisan fashion, we can address areas of critical concern while working together to make sure we are also being fiscally responsible. This legislation provides a necessary offset that is in the same vein of the bipartisan budget agreement this chamber passed just over a month ago. The American people expect us to make the tough decisions that help them in their daily lives. Be it in the military veteran looking to secure his retirement after a lifetime of duty and commitment, to the senior making sure their next doctor's visit is free from any undue stress, or ensuring that physicians can further their passion of serving their community. This legislation provides a path forward for our nation and this body in addressing their concerns. I urge full bipartisan support of this legislation and encourage the whole House to consider the important needs that the bill addresses. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith. Thank you. I rise to claim the time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for time in opposition. Thank you. I yield myself such time as I may consume. There are a number of problems with this piece of legislation. One of the biggest ones is just the process of it. Uh, this has been dropped on us at the absolute last minute. In fact, on a bill that has profound impacts on the budget um, in a number of different areas, we just moments ago received a broad outline of a score of how it's going to impact that budget uh, moments ago. We did not have time to consider this legislation adequately um, to figure out what impact it was going to have on the budget. But there are a couple things we do know about it that creates a major problem. Yes, in the short term, this pleases two constituency groups. It pleases veterans and it pleases doctors uh, by giving them the money that they want. But what was not mentioned in the speech talking about this bill in favor of it was how it is paid for. It is paid for by adding another year to sequestration. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about this. First of all, so that's eight years from now. 
We have heard nothing but from the other side of the aisle about how government is spending too much money, about how the deficit and the debt are out of control. And yet here we have upfront money being spent on the promise that eight years from now we will cover those costs. And what's worse, eight years from now, the way we're going to cover those costs is through sequestration, across the board cuts that will cut other entitlement, other mandatory spending programs. So we're really simply robbing one group of deserving people to pay another group of deserving people. That is hardly responsible and hardly helpful. There are a couple other specific aspects of this uh, that I want to mention from a Department of Defense standpoint. Focusing now just on the portion that addresses the cost of living reduction. I want to make sure we understand what exactly that cost of living reduction was. In the military, if you serve 20 years, you can retire at that point with your full pension, which is basically half of your pay um, at that point. This bill took, for those people between the ages of 42 and 62, working age, and reduced their COLA by 1%. It didn't reduce the pension. It reduced how much that pension would be increased by each year by 1%. Now, I don't deny um, that, that that is a hit and a cost. But what is it offsetting? The Pentagon has to pay this cost, or at least a portion of this cost. They have to pay the, the old bill, and again, I'm just getting the new score, but in the old bill, it was roughly $700 million a year that DOD had to take out of their operating budget and put in to paying for this pension. So by doing this, we're taking roughly $700 million a year out of the Pentagon budget. What does that mean? What it means is a further blow to readiness. Now, the Republican and Democratic members of the Armed Services Committee have rightly screamed that we are cutting readiness to the point where we are not training our forces to prepare to fight the fight that we asked them to fight. Now, the gentleman made an excellent point that basically, you know, what's going to make people want to sign up for the military? And he mentioned that while making sure that we take care of our veterans, and I certainly think that's an issue. And I'll tell you, for the last 10 years, we've increased the GI Bill, we've increased pay every single year, we have made dramatic increases in combat pay. I, I applaud this chamber for the bipartisan way in which they have taken care of our military veterans. But one other major issue that's going to determine whether or not people want to join the military and stay in it is whether or not we train them and prepare them for the fight we're going to ask them to do. And what the consequences of this is going to be is it's another blow to that. If you are a pilot, you will not have enough fuel or enough fixed equipment to train as often as you need to. If you are an infantryman, you will not have the bullets to practice as much as you need to. Doing this creates the one thing that everyone has said we don't want, and that is a hollow force a force that exists but is not trained to fight, the fight that we ask them to do. In fact, there was a great and compelling story uh, told by the chairman of the Armed Services Committee in an argument for why readiness is important, and that was the Korean War. And those were the troops that we sent over in the initial um, effort to stop the North Koreans. Those troops were not trained, and men died because they were not trained and they were not prepared for a battle that we sent them into. So we are robbing one portion of the Pentagon budget to pay another. And I think we're robbing precisely the portion that we can least afford to rob. And I don't think there's anything noble about standing up and taking money away from the readiness that's going to train our troops to fight fights that we as politicians send them to fight. Now, I will say on the SGR fix and the DOC fix, that's a short-term problem and we need to deal with it. Step aside, I'd be very, very happy to pay for that. And I support that very strongly. I do not like the pay for. Personally, I'd be more than willing to raise taxes or cut spending in other places other than to once again go back to the sequester, um, you know, go back to the sequester option, and also to kick it out eight years from now. This is an irresponsible bill that approaches very, very real problems. But make no mistake about it. You can stand up and talk about what you're paying for, who you're giving the money to, but I do hope people will address who you're taking the money from. You are taking the money from other recipients of mandatory spending by doing sequester again, and as importantly, you are taking the money away from the readiness accounts that will train our troops so that they are able to fight, so that we will hopefully not do the one thing that I think would be utterly unconscionable, and that is to send troops to a battle that we have not prepared them for. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman yields all of his time back. Or do you reserve? I said I reserve. Reserves. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. I reserve. 
gentleman from Pennsylvania reserves. The gentleman from Marston. Um, I'm happy to yield two and a half minutes to the gentlelady from Texas, though she is in support of the bill. I'm, I'm happy to give her the time. The gentlelady from Texas is uh, recognized for two and a half minutes. I thank the gentleman, and I thank uh, the manager of this legislation. I thank uh, our chairman, our ranking member of the Armed Services Committee for his consistent diligence on acting on behalf of the men and women in the United States military and certainly those who have already served. And I, for one, uh, will associate myself with the disappointment of the offset that has been offered in this legislation. Uh, no one likes sequester, and I'll add an additional uh, point of contention, is that this city is, excuse me, this nation is not broke. Uh, economists have said over and over again that we're not broke. We can fully fund and should fund our military as it relates to preparedness. That's part of uh, protecting the homeland, which I serve on the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, and then, of course, um, we all have tried uh, to deliberate on what we can do best for our doctors under what we call the SRG or the doctor fix. So let me just uh, say this as I rise to support this legislation, because I do come from Texas and I do interact with veterans across the nation and others. Uh, and as painful as the extending out of the sequester 2024, I want to just offer this thought. Uh, first of all, uh, as I have argued, and I hope maybe the light will come on that we're not broke, that we will rid ourselves of the sequester and begin to budget fully to provide investment in our people. And so the uh, reason for advocating is because as I go home every weekend and throughout the week when I'm in the district, I'll run into military personnel and or veterans uh, to speak about the impact that this would have uh, on them, their families, and certainly I believe that uh, this uh, was uh, one that needs to be corrected, and I would like to see us working fairly across the board, that we find a way to respond to uh, the high numbers at this cost, and as well um, to work with those uh, with optional ideas. I hope before 2024 we have no sequester. Uh, as my good friend has indicated, uh, it is a poor way of managing our budget. Let me also say uh, that because of the many low-income areas and the physicians that I've interacted with who indicate how difficult it is to serve my low-income low, low patients or my uh, patients that are elderly, that the doctor fix is crucial for the 18th Congressional District in providing health care uh, for those who are in need, particularly those who are elderly. So as we uh, look with uh, askance at how this has been formulated, and I know that it is uh, one that has come to us, uh, but I would hope that we would do this fix this time, uh, Mr. Speaker, and then work to undo uh, the offset so Our that we can help seniors and doctors and the veterans. Gentlelady's time has expired. I thank the gentleman, and I gentleman yield back. The gentleman from Washington reserves. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. I continue to reserve. Reserves. Gentleman from Washington. I have uh, no further speakers, so if you have no further speakers, I'll close and close. And Gentleman from Washington okay. is recognized. I think I yield myself the balance, the balance of my time. And just really to drive home one point on the armed services side of the equation, and that is the impact that personnel costs are having on the Department of Defense. They are an increasing, growing part of our defense budget, in large part um, because we have been very, very generous with the people who serve in the military uh, in terms of pay, benefits, and retirement. But as everyone who serves on the Armed Services Committee knows, that increasing personnel cost squeezes out other portions of the budget. I've talked a lot about readiness. I think that's incredibly important. Um, but also procurement, making sure that the men and women who serve in the military have the equipment that they need to fight the fight. I mean, we can, we can have a great military where everyone is very well paid, the benefits go on forever, um, but they don't have the equipment or the training necessary to fight. And I will tell you, every single expert right, left, middle, wherever, that has studied this question. We just had four think tanks, four prominent think tanks spanning that spectrum uh, come out with a study on the future of the Department of Defense budget. Every single one of those experts has said that if we do nothing to rein in personnel costs, that is precisely the force that we will have. It will be hollow. It will not have the equipment and it will not have the training to do what it is that we ask them to do. Now, we may not think that the 1% cut uh, that was done here in the COLA is the best way to go, and I can entertain that argument. I certainly understand uh, veterans who were promised this, who expect to receive it. But if it's not that, what is it? What is on the table? 
All we have done in this chamber is said no, no, no to every effort the Department of Defense has put out there to try to rein in this spending and to try to rein in this spending, as I said, so that we can have a military that lives up to what we want it to live up to. This is a very, very real issue. And once again, we are punning it and completely ignoring it, completely unaddressed by the supporters of this bill. Um, they're just addressing this narrow area, making the broader problem worse, and as I said in the beginning, also once again adding sequester uh, back into the lexicon for another year. Um, this is not a solution to any problem other uh, than a series of political ones. And we have just too many difficult choices to make to simply rely on politics with every bill that we bring up here. We've got to make some hard choices. This bill doesn't do it. It punts, once again, in every conceivable way and simply makes the problems worse. Um, I know it's not going to happen, but I would nonetheless urge this body to oppose this bill um, and make some responsible choices actually make choices as to what to do with the budget instead of continually punting on every difficult decision that comes before us. Because I assure you, this will not be the last one by any stretch of the imagination. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington yields back his time. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, it's always responsible to uh, keep the promises made to our nation's veterans. And what is before the House today is an extension of current policy that was passed in an overwhelming bipartisan fashion right here in this chamber less than two months ago. And in addition, it does protect the promises that this nation has made to our veterans. So I encourage my colleagues to vote in favor of the bill, to care for those who have borne the battle, and to send that message to all who can hear it. I yield back the balance of my time. Jim kneels back his time. The question is, Will the House suspend the rules and pass Senate 2-5 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative. Chair, I request the, the yeas and nays. From Pennsylvania. Request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. The sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this motion will be postponed. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, proceedings will resume on questions previously postponed. Votes will be taken in the following order. Ordering the previous question on House Resolution 475. Adopting the House Resolution 475, if ordered, and suspending the rules and passing S-25. The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15-minute vote. Remaining electronic votes will be conducted as five-minute votes. The unfinished business of the House is the vote on ordering the previous question on House Resolution 475 on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House calendar number 84, House Resolution 475, Resolution providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 3193 to amend the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010 to strengthen the review authority of the Financial Stability Oversight Council of regulations issued by the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection and for other purposes, providing for proceedings during the period from February 13, 2014 through February 24, 2014 and for other purposes. The question is on ordering the previous question. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote.
So the House readjusted the agenda just a bit. Right now they're voting on the previous question on financial regulations. A little bit later they will take up a couple of uh, suspension votes. Members will, uh, during this uh, particular series of vote, uh, votes, uh, vote on the repeal to cut the military pensions, the COLA, the cost of living adjustment, also uh, on the DOC fix fund. So it looks like a series of three votes and uh, we will uh, continue bringing you the uh, House votes here on C-SPAN. A little bit later, we do expect a debate on the rule for the Republicans' debt ceiling legislation. The House Rules Committee did meet this afternoon, crafting debate rules. A vote on the rule and the bill itself is expected this evening, as the, the House is a little bit concerned about uh, any delay that could occur in working out a deal because of a winter storm that's approaching the Washington, D.C. area probably hit the area sometime tomorrow evening. According to CQ, the vote will be on a clean extension of the debt limit until March 2015, since Republican leaders abandoned a plan to include policy riders with the provision. The House also planning to vote on a standalone measure to uh, repeal the uh, reduction in the cost of living pension increases for younger military veterans uh, today. Earlier today, House Republican leaders met and discussed the House agenda, also the debt ceiling negotiations. Here's a look at that. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Freezing. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> <laughs> Your you just introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Brad Wenstrup. I represent Ohio's 2nd District. You know, as of December, my district still has three counties that has double-digit unemployment. And these are people that all want to work. And none of the Ohioans that I talk to describe as their current situation as liberating. Just last week, I got a note from a constituent named Bill. And Bill says, I want to earn my own way. He says, I want to work. Work and making it on your own is liberating, and it's a source of pride for American families. To have the White House celebrate the reduction of two and a half million full-time jobs due entirely to Obamacare five years into this weak economy is a disservice to Bill and every other American who's out there looking for a job, out there seeking their own independence. In the State of the Union just two weeks ago, President Obama talked about working hard and taking responsibility so you can get ahead in America. Now the administration says, pursue your dreams by working less. I didn't know that was the new American dream. The American dream is to work, just ask Bill, for my district. The House, we have solutions. We passed the Skills Act, trying to get more people into employment, getting employment education. We talk about energy and things that we need to do. Right now we need Harry Reid in the Senate to act because Bill and other out-of-work Ohioans need Harry Reid to act so they can access, access job training that they need and want. We just need partners in the Senate and the White House who are committed to unleashing the power of the American worker and the American economy. Thank you. As all of you know, the CBA CBO report released last week stated that pres the president's health care law will cause a drop in work hours equal to a loss of 2.3 million full-time workers. And just when we thought the rollout of this law couldn't get any worse, the White House decided to delay the employer mandate again. This must be what a year of action looks like. Our friends on the other side of the aisle are defending reduced hours for workers, arguing that it will create more free time to spend with your family. The truth is this law is impacting the employer and even more importantly the employees who depend on those hours to support their families. In all the time I spent talking to Kansans, I've yet to find a mom or a dad who's struggling to make ends meet, who thinks that it would just be swell if the government instituted a policy that forced their employer to cut their wages by 25% so they could spend more time at home. People want to work. They want to control their own lives. They want to provide for their families. And they need relief from this law. Good morning. Yesterday, uh, we saw something that unfortunately has become the new norm for this administration. Uh, President Obama moved to again 
uh, unilaterally delay parts of Obamacare, ignoring the law, and unfortunately the impact is um, that we have increased uncertainty. And right now, I think that we can look back and see this Obamacare law uh, was initially passed with a delay until after to the 2012 election year uh, so that the people of this country uh, couldn't see the broken promises uh, that had occurred. Well, once again yesterday, we are delaying uh, this law uh, and, uh, you know, Ob President Obama is doing so without Congress being involved. Now listen, we in the House have always agreed uh, that the business mandate, the employer mandate, as well as the individual mandate will harm the working middle class and hurt job growth. We have been about that every single day. And we have said that the answer is not to sow more uncertainty and not to breed more chaos, but it was to delay this law for all Americans, not just special interest. And so what we've seen in the House is we've seen our committees begin to work to try and produce an America that works for everybody, a health care law that works for everybody. And uh, Ways and Means Committee marked up last week uh, the repeal of the 40-hour, uh, the 30-hour work week. As uh, Lynn Jenkins just said, we have many, many people now, most of whom are at the bottom end of the income scale, who have seen their hours cut back, who don't have health care, and then the administration and the Democrats are saying that that's better for them. They don't have to work. They can go and spend more time with their families. Well, I asked them, what do they say to these moms and dads at the end of the month when they can't make ends meet and pay their bills? So we in the House remain committed to an America that does work, a health care system that does work. Obamacare is just not working. And we want to work with this president to sit down and make it so that this country can work for everybody. Good morning. In our efforts to get America to work, and make America work, we were excited that the president uh, said he was going to join us in making this a year of action. And in order for this to be successful, we need to start by being honest about the current place that we find ourselves as Americans. We've seen another disappointing jobs report, and it's leaving moms and dads and young people struggling to bring home a paycheck. We've seen a health law that, despite the fact that the administration continues to say that it is working, uh, it's estimated that over 2 million Americans will lose their jobs over the next decade. And just yesterday, we saw where the administration issued this unilateral uh, delay of Obamacare, another sign that the health care law is not working. We see a labor force that is shrinking, not growing. Ten million jobs lost it, since this administration took office. And we see a health care law that is hurting more people than it is helping. We see our fellow Americans facing more limits than opportunities. This is not a good start to a year of action. So we hope that the President will join us. Be honest about where we start and where we find ourselves. Let's get to work on making this a year of action, getting America to work. Um, when the President said he wanted a year of action, that's probably what most Americans wanted. They want to see actions. We want to see actions. We want to see our bills that we, more than 160, vote to the Senate. Not get, don't even get brought up. We want to see action on those as well. But to have action, you have to have trust and you have to have fairness. Now, what transpired just in the last two weeks? First, you had the CBO come out. Two and a half million Americans will be out of the workforce because of Obamacare. Then yesterday, based upon that study, what does he do? Delays business. Loses trust. And where's the fairness? Business is picked over individuals. America, we're a collective of individuals, become strength bound together. But he doesn't see that. The idea that we live within a framework that individuals, the House and the Senate and the President works together, but he doesn't believe in that trust or building that trust either. Just unilaterally deciding what in the law should be going forward and what should not. I think the country asks for more. I think the country expects more. If you want to build action, you have to build trust and you have to build fairness. And you have to be honest with the approach of what we want to take. On Friday, uh, we got another disappointing jobs report. 
And you know, I think the American people are tired of being disappointed. They're tired of settling for this new normal uh, under uh, the Obama economy. And frankly, they're tired of asking the question, where are the jobs? Uh, that's why we need to be working together with the president uh, to expand our economy, expand the opportunities for our fellow citizens. That's why we sent the president a letter uh, two weeks ago outlining areas that he talked about in the State of the Union address, uh, bills that we've already passed that are sitting over in the Senate, places where we can work together. And whether it's uh, skills training, whether it's uh, kids research, uh, other issues, there are places where we can work together. Uh, and so we've see, received no response from the president, nothing. Listen, if the president won't work with us uh, on these simple issues, uh, who would ever expect that he would be able to work with us on the more complex issues that we face? Questions? What happened in the past 12 hours on this debt ceiling thing? Was this a miscalculation by your leadership, or did you feel you needed to take the temperature, or was this just a trial? Uh, listen, uh, you've all known that uh, our members uh, are not crazy about voting to increase the debt ceiling. Uh, there are, our members are also very upset with the president. He won't negotiate. He won't deal with our long-term spending problems without us raising taxes. Uh, won't even sit down and discuss these issues. Uh, he's the one driving up uh, the debt. Then you know, the question they're asking is, well, why should I deal with his debt limit? And so the fact is, uh, we'll let the Democrats uh, put the votes up. We'll put a minimum number of votes up uh, to get it passed. What's a ballpark minimum? I mean, and, I, mean I, I know you had the Sandy vote last year, which won 49 Republicans, and isn't that some abdication of responsibility of the majority party? Oh, I understand. It's the president driving up the debt, and the president wanting to do nothing about of the debt that's, that's occurring will not engage in our long-term spending problem. And so let his party give him the debt ceiling increase that he wants. Listen, this is a lost opportunity for America. We've got, we're on a spending traje tra trajectory that's unsustainable. The president knows it. Every Democrat and every Republican in this town knows it. Uh, and it has to be dealt with. And so it's a disappointing uh, moment, I can tell you that. Mr. Speaker, this is the first time that you've gone to the floor with a clean debt ceiling bill without, I guess, putting up a fight for putting up Republican priorities for this. Is this a recognition that post-government shutdown you don't have the political leverage to fight the president on this? No, it's uh, the fact that we don't have 218 votes. And when you don't have 218 votes, you have nothing. We've seen that before, and we'll see it again. Last question. Uh, about two and a half years ago, the Boehner Rule made its debut, equal cuts for equal increase in debt limit. Is the Boehner Rule dead? I would hope not. As I said before, this is a, a lost opportunity. Uh, we could have sat down and worked together in a bipartisan manner uh, to find cuts and reforms that are greater than the increase in the debt limit. It would have helped us uh, begin to solve the spending problem we have, begin the process of paying down our debt. And so uh, I am disappointed, to say the least. Mr. Speaker, has the president or, or uh, Ms. Pelosi given you any indication how many Democrats will support this? Or uh, I made it clear to uh, Ms. Pelosi yesterday that if we went this route, uh, I would expect uh, virtually every Democrat to vote for it. And she said? And she agreed. And if that happens, if every Democrat votes for it, could you say that 18 Republicans will vote for it? Uh, we're going to have to find them. I'll be one of them. Mr. Speaker, um, by at least offering um, to go back on the COLA cuts uh, for military retirees, haven't you made it harder in the long term to deal with military benefit, or military compensation reform, and things like chain CPI for COLAs, which you guys have talked about as a as a No, not I don't think so. I think that what uh, we uh, we're proposing uh, changing is those who have already retired, those who have already uh, signed up uh, for service, uh, part of the law that. Uh, uh, says from Janu those who enlist from January 1st on will be covered under this new formula. Uh, it's a, a fairer way to assess this. Thanks. Thank you. Oh my, what a wonderful day. That briefing from earlier today, right now on the House floor, members voting on a procedural motion related to the cost of living adjustment for military retirees. After this, we expect a vote on the rule for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau replacement and then a vote on passage of the military retiree COLA bill. 
French President Francois Hollande is here in Washington for a three-day visit. Yesterday, he spent time with President Obama at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's estate. Today, President Hollande was officially welcomed to the White House with a ceremony on the South Lawn. And tonight, there will be a state dinner in his honor at the White House. The two also held a joint press conference this afternoon, and we plan to show that to you shortly. Once again, the House is uh, in the series of votes right now. Right now, a, a vote on a procedural motion related to the cost of living adjustment for military retirees. It's a 15-minute vote. Later, we're expecting debate on the rule for the Republicans' debt ceiling legislation. The House Rules Committee did meet this afternoon to craft debate rules and a vote on the rule and the bill itself expected this evening as the, the House is concerned about any delay that could occur in working out a deal because of an approaching winter storm. That's expected to hit Washington sometime tomorrow evening. After this series, we do expect debate on the roll and then general debate, followed by a vote on final passage. That should happen sometime around 5.30.
222 and the nays are 195. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. On that, I request the a recorded from Colorado, vote. The gentleman from Colorado. On that, I request a recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. So a five-minute vote now on the rule for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau replacement, and then we expect a vote on passage of the military retiree COLA bill. The Associated Press has this. Congress is responding to some election year pressure from veterans groups. The House is poised today to approve a measure restoring full cost of living increases to pension benefits for military retirees. And the Senate is debating a similar bill. The change to the cost of living benefits was the most controversial part of a budget bill that Congress approved late last year. So debate and vote on the Republicans' clean debt ceiling uh, bill coming up after uh, this series of votes. House leadership has moved up work on this bill because of a storm that's heading up the coast from the south. From the AP, forecasters say the ice storm that's moving into Georgia could be the kind that only happens once or uh, once every 10 or 20 years in that area, and they're predicting ice accumulations of as much as three quarters of an inch from Atlanta to central South Carolina. President Obama has declared an emergency in Georgia, ordering federal agencies to help with the state and local response, and that storm is heading toward Washington.
On this vote, the yeas are 223, the nays are 193, with one answering present. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick, to suspend the rules and pass H. S.25, as amended, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Senate 25, an act to direct the Secretary of the Interior to convey certain federal features of the electric distribution system to the South Utah Valley Electric Service District and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. So votes now essentially on final passage of the military retirees cost of living increases bill. After we this, we expect a debate on a couple of non-controversial suspension bills and then votes at about 4 o'clock on the rule for the debt limit extension. 5.30, there would be a final passage vote on the debt ceiling extension, which would finish out legislative business for the week. Here's how the Associated Press is looking at the debt ceiling debate. Unwilling to risk spooking the markets and leading a fractured GOP majority, House Speaker Boehner today stepped back from a confrontation with Democrats to let Congress vote on increasing the government's borrowing cap without trying to extract any concessions from the White House. The move risks more displeasure from the Tea Party that came after most Republicans in the House made clear that they had no taste for another high-stakes fight with President Obama over the nation's debt ceiling, which must be raised so the government can borrow money to pay all of its bills. A vote was scheduled for this evening, with Democrats lined up to provide the bulk of support to pass the measure. The Senate was expected to pass the bill and send it to the President by the end of this week.
suspended the bill is passed and without objection the motion to reconsider is laid on the table The chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, Sir, due to my recent appointment to the House Judiciary Committee, I hereby resign from the House.